comes from the Gospel of Matthew, chapter 5. It's uh, part of Jesus' Sermon on the Mount. It's one of the toughies, you know? Sometimes uh, uh, the things Jesus gives us to do, uh, that he teaches us, we say, oh yeah, well, I, I can do that, I can do that. It might be a little tough, but, I, but here's a tough one. Here's a, here's a tough uh, series of things uh, that Jesus uh, has asked us and instructed us to do. Let me get over on this side. You have heard it said, You've heard that it was said, eye for an eye and tooth for a tooth. But I tell you, do not resist an evil person. If anyone slaps you on the right cheek, turn to them the other cheek also. And if anyone wants to sue you and take your shirt, hand over your coat as well. If anyone forces you to go one mile, go with them two miles. May God add his blessing to the reading of this word. That is... Not always easy, these things that Jesus, uh, it is actually a section of the Sermon on the Mount that's tough, it's demanding. But the part of this I want to bring out, I want to talk about today, is the idea of being in conflict, and we can hear a little bit about that here, the idea of being in conflict with other people. And how often this happens, probably more times than we can care uh, for it to happen in our lives, that we find ourselves in conflict with someone, and, and we, fi we figure out that there's really no good Choice. I mean, you, you have two choices, two alternatives, and neither of them are good. Neither of them make anyone happy. And that, that happens so often. We find ourselves in a situation where we have to choose between two things and we're not excited about either one. In fact, we may not like at all either choice that we have. Well, this happens all, happens all the time in the Bible. And it happened quite a lot in the life of Jesus Christ. During his life, he was, uh, uh, several times, he was approached by the Pharisees. And we often think of the Pharisees as uh, this group that was around in Jesus' day. And we kind of think of them as the bad guys that nobody liked. But in fact, a lot of people liked the Pharisees, the common folk really liked and appreciated them. Uh, they may not have joined the Pharisees, but they, they had a really good reputation among the common people because they were very, they were very pious and they were very good at, at giving and, and, and doing all the things that you're supposed to do and that the law calls for people to do or called for them to do. And, and so they were very popular and these people didn't like them uh, Jesus much because Jesus was also very popular among the same group. He was cutting in on their group of people. And so one day they brought him a, a question. And they intentionally formed this question so that there was really no good answer to the question. And actually they do this several times. Uh, we'll talk about two of the times today. The first, remember, has to do with taxes. Is that good old story about Jesus, uh, uh, the Pharisees coming to Jesus and, and saying, okay, should we give taxes to Rome, our oppressors, or should we not give taxes to Rome? To giving taxes or not giving taxes? And uh, this was a no-win situation for Jesus. I mean, they were giving him two alternatives, and neither of them was good. If he said give taxes, then that, that would make him a traitor to Israel. And if he said don't give taxes, that would make him a traitor uh, to Rome. So no good alternative and no obvious third way to go. Just two choices and neither of them good. Well, as I said, the Pharisees were very good at this. Another time that we know many of us here know about and thought about is the time that they brought a woman who was caught in the very act of committing adultery. And they brought her to Jesus and told him that according to the law, she should be stoned and killed right there. So what should they do? Should they follow the law and kill her or should they not? follow the law? Should they ignore the law? And of course, another no-win situation. That's the way it was framed. You have two choices. You can go this way or you can go that way. Neither of them are good. If they had ignored the law, that would have been a bad thing. They would have told everyone that Jesus doesn't abide by the law of Moses, which he certainly uh, did and was proud to do during his life. And the other choice was uh, that she would be killed. This woman would be killed right there in front of everyone, and, uh, and everyone, of course, if, if Jesus had been a part of that, would have thought him terribly cruel uh, and mean if that had happened. Plus, it would have been a terrible injustice as well, which Jesus could never be a part of. Well, another case where there are two options, and there seem to be only two options, and no obvious third way. Now, how often this comes up in our lives? Now, it may seem, and we may think that most of the conflicts that we have in life are win-lose. You know, and about half the time we'll win, or about half the time we'll lose. But the fact is that most of the time when we get in conflict, it's with somebody we care about, somebody that we love. Uh, sometimes it's a co-worker that, you know, we care about that relationship, we want to nurture it. Sometimes it's a friend, sometimes it's a spouse 
or, or a family member, someone we're in a relationship with, and we get into a conflict with them, and it is one of those situations where somebody's going to win and somebody's going to lose, and there's no real obvious uh, third way. And so what do we do? We think, well, I'm, then I'm going to win. I want to win this conflict. I want to lose it. I want to be the winner. And, and then and we work at that and we try. And yes, we do. We are the winner of the conflict. And we're happy for about a minute and a half until we look over and we see a person that we love who is now the loser of the conflict. And suddenly we realize this is a no-win situation. We get into a conflict with somebody we love, somebody we care about. If we win, we want to win. If we do, that means it makes somebody we love the loser of the conflict. And that doesn't help us at all. It certainly doesn't make us any happier whatsoever. This happens quite often in the church, in churches in general. We've all heard of times when the church has gotten into a tussle because this group wants new pew cushions, and this group wants the old pew cushions, and they're, they're in conflict with each other. And then there's a third group who doesn't care about the pew cushions at all. They're the biggest group, actually. But these two groups go at it, and they know that one of them is going to win, and one of them is going to lose. You can't both have new and old pew cushions. That just won't work. There seem to be two choices there, and one person, one group is going to win, and the other group is going to lose, and I'll guess, but you know what? Everybody is going to suffer. One may win and the other may lose, but everybody throughout this process, this conflict, this choice between one or the other is going to suffer. So what do we do? What do we do? How do we get through these times, especially when we're in conflict with someone that we care about? Someone that we love. Well, we can try to do what Jesus did. And that is to find a third way. To find a third way. Jesus actually was an expert at this. It does make sense that he was because God was also, and is also, an expert at finding a third way. We see it throughout the Bible. And we certainly see it in the life of Jesus. And the two examples I just gave when the Pharisees came, and then they were, and they take Jesus this, oh, and they really got him. They must have thought they had him backed up against a wall. We'll just think about taxes. Boy, one thing you don't want to talk about is you know, politics, right? And here they're bringing him a question of politics right there in the church, right there among his believers. What's he going to do? He's got to choose one side or the other, doesn't he? He's backed against the wall. And Jesus there, has that choice, he could either say, uh, you know, pay your taxes and be a traitor to Israel. Don't pay your taxes, be a traitor to Rome. Those of the two choices, and Jesus brings God into the question, brings God into the argument, and he finds a third way. Instead of making it about taxes, instead of making it about Caesar, or about Israel, or about any nation, Jesus makes it about God. And our relationship with God, give to Caesar what is Caesar's, he said, give to God what is God's. There. They give him two choices, and Jesus showed how easily he was able to find this third way. He did it with the woman as well, with the woman caught in adultery. This is such a wonderful story because of the third way that Jesus finds. It does seem like it's one or the other. And here we're going to either have uh, somebody who's, uh, somebody, uh, is gonna, this woman is going to be killed, right? Uh, if the law is followed, the woman is going to be executed. And then on the other side of the possibility of the other choice that Jesus could make, the law is not going to be followed. It's not going to be honored. The law of Moses, no good choice there. And so what does Jesus do? Well, he finds a third way. And he says to the men there holding the stones, ready to stone this woman, ready to kill her, let you who is without sin cast the third stone. You see what Jesus did again? He brought God into it. He brought God's relationship with this, these men into this conversation. And he found a third way. They said that the men departed. I love the little fact that you may remember that the oldest departed first. The oldest men, the wisest there. And that's, in my experience, very true. The wisest among us are the first to accept to embrace a third way, a third alternative. Well, how do we do this? We find ourselves in some conflict, some, maybe with somebody we care for, somebody we love, maybe in some other conflict in our lives, and how do we find a third way? Well, one way thing the Bible tells us is a good way to do this. 
Actually, the Apostle Paul, as he's talking and thinking about how do we live as Christians, how do we live within the church, Paul said, okay, you didn't do an argument with somebody, with you know, somebody in the church. Uh, you know, to pray about it, try to resolve it, and if you can't, then go to the elders. And so one way to find a third way is to consult with other people. You know, to ask them uh, what you should do. I actually, when I'm um, coaching young couples, I call it premarital coaching that they have before they're married. And one suggestion that I heard a long ago, and I always, I always thought it was a great suggestion uh, for young couples, or for any couples at all, any relationship really, is to, uh, to find a couple uh, that you respect, whose marriage you respect, whose marriage you like. And maybe a couple who's a few years down the road. So if you're just getting married, maybe you find a couple who's uh, been, who's been married five years. And find this couple and make, so make them your mentors, make them your guide. And I'll tell you, if you're able to go to somebody, if you're facing some situation, some conflict, you can go to these, uh, go to a folks like that and they may know just what to do. They may have already figured out that third way through rough and hard experience and so you can embrace that third way as well. Sometimes finding the third way takes somebody who's kind of uh, impartial. On the outside, I, I can't tell you how many times this happens in church, uh, in, in this church, in all churches, is we are where it's, we're facing some situation, some decision, and there's a choice between A or B. And if you choose A, these folks aren't going to like it. If you choose B, these folks aren't going to like it. And so it's really a no-win situation, especially for the minister. And so one thing uh, I used to think that was the best thing to do was for me to go and sit in my office and look at both sides and pray about it and think about it, decide which of the two is best for the church, and then put all my weight behind getting that one through and making sure that that thing happens. But then I've come to learn that there's actually a much better way to do it, and that is talk to as many people as possible. Talk to as many folks in the congregation as possible. It's very possible that a consensus over one of the two is going to build up. But what's even more possible, I found, is somebody's going to raise their hand and say, hey, instead of doing this or doing this, have you thought about this third way of doing it? And everybody kind of goes, it's their head and goes, of course, of course, the third way, yes, that's what we should do. And then a great consensus builds around that, uh, that sort of grassroots idea that has sprung up. I always like the story of the, the city engineers who were called out to the tunnel. And uh, uh, there in the tunnel, uh, they found a semi uh, wedged in the tunnel. It was, the tunnel was too small, and the semi had tried to get in anyway. And actually, the, uh, the trailer had just wedged into the tunnel and had done some damage there at the top. But mostly, they just couldn't get it out. The truck couldn't be backed out. It was stuck in this tunnel. And they sat there for a long time trying to figure out what to do. They thought of just dragging it out, getting a couple of tow trucks, and just pulling it out. And they realized that you know, the whole tunnel could collapse if they did that. And they were trying to puzzle through it. And about that time, a family drove past. And then the mom rolled down the window and asked the policeman what was going on. And the policeman told her. And the boy, a 10-year-old boy in the back seat, said, well, why don't they just let the air out of the tires? And the thing will go down, and then they can just roll it back. And the policeman said, what? Well, seems like a good idea. And he went to tell the engineers that. And they were like, of course. And that's exactly what they did. Within an hour, the truck was out because of the advice of this boy. Now, what does that tell you? One thing I think it tells all of us today is that when it comes, one thing that was required sometimes for finding the third way is some humility, right? This willingness to be able to take advice from other people, take advice from someone else, open our hearts to the possibility that there's another alternative, the possibility that there's another way. Yeah, that takes some humility on our part. The willingness to open ourselves to the possibility of a third choice. The possibility of a third way. Well, throughout the Bible, God has done this. And in fact, the story of salvation is the story of God choosing a third way. You know, there seemed to be a, the classic problem that we have as, as human beings that we've always had, as we read back in the Bible, is that God has a path for us. And God wants to follow us to follow that path, but we are no good at that. And we get off the path, and we get off the track, and we go our own way instead. And then when we do, we feel far away from God. We feel as if God has abandoned us, because we are no longer on God's path. We feel as if we are being punished. And so God thought, God said, well, what can I do? What's the possibilities I can do? Well, God began by sending an intercessor, somebody like Moses, who would help the people uh, out of their captivity in Egypt. 
and then get them into Israel. And then once his time was over, God sent judges to help the people stay on track. And they did a pretty good job at that, but their time ended as well. And so God sent kings to help the people, and then priests, and then prophets, all trying to help keep the people on track, helping us to stay on track. But always, always we would pull off. We would try to find our own way instead of God's way. And so finally the time came for God to choose the third way. Instead of sending another person, another human being, God sent his son into this world. And through his son, even when we go off track, even when we are far away from God, we can get right back to him. Through his son Jesus Christ and through the forgiveness that he offers. In our story of salvation, we see God choosing the third way. Well, I, we see this again in the life of Jesus. Just one more example. When Jesus uh, was talking in our scripture here today, he said, always go the second mile. And there's an interesting story behind that. In fact, during this time, as the Romans were occupying uh, Israel, of course, they were having to pay taxes and all that. And another obligation that the people had was if you were walking along and a Roman soldier was marching with his pack, he could say to you by law, hey, you stop and carry my pack for one mile. One mile, you were required to carry the soldier's pack. Now think about how humiliating that would have, potentially dangerous that would have been for these Hebrew people. What would their friends think if they saw them carrying the pack, the hated Roman soldier? They looked like collaborators, and if their friends were understanding, it would at least look like they were, uh, I mean, it would just be embarrassing. It would be an embarrassing situation being forced to do this. And so it seems to me we have two bad options. Right? You either carry the pack of the soldier and you look like a traitor or people uh, pity you, or you don't carry the pack of the soldier and guess what? You're beaten or maybe you're killed. Probably either one. It probably depends on the day. Two bad choices. Nothing else to do. But then Jesus says and shows to his people a third way. So instead of going a mile with the soldier, go two miles. Go the extra mile with the soldier. And what's this going to do? Well, it's going to show, first of all, do what Jesus so often does with power. It's going to show that you're in control. You actually have the power. The soldier wants you to go one mile. No, I'm not going to go one mile. I'm going to go two miles. And in that two miles, in those 40 minutes you're with the soldier, maybe you'll have the chance to share your faith with that soldier. Maybe you'll be able, to be able to tell them about God's love and about Christ's sacrifice. 40 minutes and boy, you could tell them the whole story. That was a wonderful way of finding a third way, a third alternative. Listen, you may find it this week or sometimes in the month ahead where you are in conflict and maybe it'll be with somebody you don't know or maybe it'll be with someone that you love dearly. Maybe you feel like you're, you're going to be set up so that you get, it's a no-win situation. Either way, uh, you're going to lose. But just remember that with God leading the way and by seeking the help of those around you, you may well be able to find a third way. Let's bow in prayer. Loving God, we do know that conflict is going to come to us no matter what. And we know that that's not always a bad thing, that conflict can help us to grow and help us to change. Well, loving God, help us to see, especially in times when there do seem to be two choices that, that neither of them are good. Help us to, to pray and to seek your guidance and to seek the advice of those around us and help us to, to look for and to seek a third way in our lives. Loving God, we know that so often this can lead us right to the path that you would have for us. Lord, we are asking uh, that you help us to be inspired to follow you in this way each and every day. And Lord, as we come to this table with this bread and this cup, Lord, may that help us. May it feed us and help us uh, to be able to receive all that you're giving us here so that we can each and every day follow uh, and do the very best for you that we can and feel completely and thoroughly nourished and ready for this week ahead. Loving God, do bless this bread and this cup that we're about to receive. It is in Jesus Christ's name we pray. Amen.